Okay, so let us do a quick revision. What is the constitution? Now, by and large, every church will have its constitution. And the constitution is um, a booklet or a document that helps you understand about the church, number one, and help you understand what are your membership responsibilities, all right? That's the constitution. Look at page 228. Okay, 228. Just very quick revision. Now, what is the purpose of a constitution? It highlights the doctrinal position, administration of a church, and its distinctives. These three things are often found in the constitution. Doctrinal position, which we'll cover today. Administration, which we've said before, it is Presbyterian. And church distinctives. We just went through that over and over again the last three Fridays, right? So it should be clear to you. Now, number t- page 2 to 9. It is a rule book. Oh no, we don't like rules. <laughs> Whenever I say rule book, we don't like. But every organization in this world has its set of um, rules. When you join a company, they have um, their own contract with you, right? And then all the rules as an employee, what you must observe. And when you observe um, those rules, um, you're allowed to continue to work in the company, right? So rules. You join a club, it's the same. But point number two, uh, page two to nine, one thing that is important to note is that when you join membership, by the way, those of you who are getting baptized, the day you get baptized by this, um, by this church, you are automatically enrolled as a member. Okay? For those who are members of other church, you wish to join um, on that day the same. Both of you will take an oath. All right, point number two, it is a rule book and every member is bound by oath to observe. So on that day, questions will be asked regarding your beliefs, whether you have understood and you believe and you, yeah, you have the same conviction and you embrace and you will practice the same um, beliefs of this church. Okay, so that's why we make you go through BBK. That's why I take a lot of time explaining BBK to make sure you understand. Um, point number two, again, some people don't like rule books, but we must understand point, two, two, uh, point number two, second line, it helps to maintain unity and harmony of the church. Without a constitution, without a rule book, or without um, some contractual agreements in a company, it will be chaos. Okay, so this is not negative, it's very positive. As a member, you should like it because it makes things clear. In fact, um, point number two, the last part, it makes very clear the responsibilities and duties of leaders and members and it minimizes any misunderstanding that may arise. Okay, so whenever there are disputes, we go back to scriptures first, of course, and then the constitution. Okay, so that is why it is important. Point number three, the constitution avoids partiality. You know what's partiality? Partiality means people get treated differently. It avoids that. It prevents that. Because even leaders, and especially leaders, they are subject to the constitution. So a leader cannot say, I like your face. You buy things for me, I like you. You always praise me, I like you even more. All right, anything you do, it's okay. Then the others, I don't quite like you, I treat you badly. Hmm? I let you teach. I let you take leadership position because I like you. Even though you are not a member or you break church rules, you don't believe the church believes, I make you a leader. Never mind. Or the other one, I don't like you. So I don't let you. No matter how um, good you are. So it avoids partiality. Understand that. Um, And now here is important. Point number three. So the constitution ensures partiality. I told you to underline that. Number two, it provides guidelines for discipline. That's the last line. Underline that. It provides guidelines for discipline of errant members. Now, why do you swear membership? Because you swear to keep the peace of the church by not introducing any um, things that are contrary to the beliefs of the church we have been made clear. All right? So, for example, you, you don't agree with total abstinence. You say, no, Christians should, should still drink socially, drink alcoholic wine, and then you know that is the distinctive of this church, then you join. 
And then you go around telling people, oh, yeah, don't be so uptight, just drink, it's okay. You know, secretly at home, drink, when we go out, we can drink, it's alright. And then you will cause problems, right? But then, because you have sown on the day of membership that you believe in our distinctives, you're of the same faith, you practice the same thing, it's in you, your conviction, then we will say to you, we will have to discipline you. Okay, we will have to discipline you because you are causing um, divisions in church against our beliefs which you swore that you will uphold and practice, right or not? Then we will have to take disciplinary action. Um, number one, to tell you to stop, I encourage you to stop. If you refuse to stop, then take stronger action, you will be rebuke. Then if you refuse, then the next step will be if you are having any leadership position, then um, to stop you from your area of service. Um, well, of course, we will, we will also have to stop you from partaking of the Holy Communion if you live in sin. For example, you commit adultery, commit fornication. The church will also have to discipline um, errant members. There are so many people who don't want to be members. I don't have authority over me. I can do what I want. The church can't do anything to me. I don't like your church beliefs, so I don't be a member. I stir problems. Nothing you can do to me. We will still speak to you. All right. Now, then the question is this. Why do we have discipline? For, number one, the peace and unity of the church. Understand that? Number one, that. And very importantly, why church have discipline? And church discipline is very seldom practiced today. The most important thing for church discipline is this. That the church removes sin. When the church allows sin, when the church tolerates sin in the church, God is not pleased. Understand that. Remember when the first church was set up? Um, um, Ananias and Sapphira, they lied. They brought sin into the church. What did God do? Immediately God disciplined them. And then from then on, the church leaders are supposed to learn that. So it's for the purity of the church. Number three, why is church discipline important? Because it is for the good of the member. Understand that. When a member is disciplined, it is not to shame the member. It is not to want to kick the member out. It is to help the member repent. Understand that. We had to exercise church discipline. In churches that have attended, we've seen it exercised. And the outcome is positive because church discipline is to help the member repent and come back to God. Understand that. People who have committed fornication, people who have committed um, um, uh, grievous sins, then the church helped them to repent, the church helped them to come back to God um, through a set of um, activities as part of discipline. Tell them they must come for prayer meeting regularly now, they must come for uh, Bible studies regularly now, give them certain areas, certain books to read, certain passages of Bible to read, so that through that, they repent and they come back to God. That is the reason for church discipline upon the member. Understand that? It is for the member's good. So that is why that is a useful thing. A useful thing. Now, everyone, if you're worshipping in a church that you will be there for a long time, extended period, you should be a member of the church because church membership is authority over you. It is a care over you. Understand that? It is God's way of providing um, a covering over you to protect you, to help you, to care for you. It is, it is not to make life difficult for you because when there is no um, authority over you, you can go wrong, you can go crazy, you know, go wild. And church helps you. So understand why we have membership in church. Now, the next thing is this. Um, why church membership is also important. Okay, turn to page 230. Now, please remember this, point number two. While church, while church membership is important, any person who finds the constitution of the church is too restrictive need not join as a member. Now, if you find that, no, I don't like to believe in what the church believes, I don't agree with biblical separation, I want to work with ecumenists, I want to work with new evangelicals, I want to work with charismatics, Roman Catholics, I don't believe in this church biblical separation stand, I don't believe in total abstinence, I don't believe. 
that Christ will return physically um, before the millennium. All these things, I, I find it not necessary to believe then you do not have to join membership. Some people feel that the moment I come to your church, I must join membership. Right? You learn first. If you still cannot, it's okay. You don't have to. We welcome the last sign of point number two. We always welcome people to remain and worship as friend and visitor. Okay? But the important thing is point number four. Okay? Now, if any time a member feels that he cannot agree with the constitution, likewise for a non-member, you are free to move on to find another church that is more suitable to your understanding and interpretation of the word. To cause disruption, underline this, to cause disruption in the church would be to sow discord. Alright, so underline that. For the member, you are breaking your vow before God and the congregation by disrupting the unity and peace of the church. Underline that. Okay, now, please look at page 231. The Bible tells us that, uh, that there are things that are abominable to God. Page 231, six things. One of the six things is, and he that soweth discord among brethren. This is something that God sees as, God used the word abomination. Something that he finds very disgusting, that is sinful. Sowing discord among brethren is one of them. Okay, so, now, you know, most people, I think most churches, when they do their catechism, they won't say all these things. <laughs> they won't, please join, please join, please join, join lah, you know. And let's have BBK. All right, three hours done. Okay, now you can join. Why do I emphasize this so much? Because I rather have a united church than a church with many, many, many members that are fighting all the time. Understand that. God's church is the body of Christ. We do not want it to be ripped apart. That's why we say we welcome all to worship. But as a member, you must understand that when you join, you do not sow discord. Same for a non-member. You're very welcome to worship as long as you wish, for the rest of your life even. But same condition as the member, do not sow discord. Understand that? Why it is so important? Because it is the minister's responsibility, it's every church leader's responsibility to you as a member to make this clear. We are simply exercising our responsibility to you. I hope you understand that. Why do I say that? Some of you have children. You, leave your, you bring your children to Sunday school. You leave them with Sunday school teachers, right? Some of you have older children. You leave them to Bible study groups. Now, how would you like a church after you believe, you understand all this, but when your children go to Sunday school or goes to Bible study, they are taught something else by teachers who do not believe or members who do not believe in the church beliefs. They teach the opposite thing. Do you feel safe? Do you feel it is right as a member? So when the church does that, it is fulfilling its responsibilities to its members. Understand that. That is why we make it very clear, certain roles in the church are not for non-members. Then people may say, wow, this church is very legalistic. Wow, must be member, then can teach. Must be member, then can be this. Must, that kind of thing. You must understand why. Because... Sunday school teachers, you leave your children with Sunday school teachers. If a Sunday school teacher do not believe in total abstinence, secretly tell your child, you know when you grow up, uh, it's okay, I uh, can drink wine, uh, you know, this church is like that. Uh. Or they tell you, it's okay, you know, Roman Catholics believe are also alright, this church is very critical, it's okay. Uh. Then your child will be confused. As a member, you have, at least the church have exercised its responsibility, you have understood our beliefs, the most we can do is to tell you, would you swear that you will not cause discord? I cannot open your heart and see whether you are like that or not. I cannot. The church fulfills its responsibilities at least in putting these things in place. Understand that? So that is our responsibility. Um, it is not because we are legalistic and we are difficult. So areas that non-members, we would not allow them to do, to participate is in teaching. Because 
In other words, the overall principle is in areas of influence. Hmm? Because you will influ you can if you're not a member, and the worst is you're not a member for a long time because you always don't believe in what the church believes, right? So for a person who is in the church for a long, long time and refuse to be a member, what does it mean? All this while, I don't agree with your church belief. And then you let them um, have areas of influence. The fact that they're not in a church and refuse to be a member for a long time means their conviction is very strong. I cannot believe your church belief, right? And then you let them have areas of influence is very dangerous. It will cause problems in the church. So areas of influence are areas like teaching, right or not? Teaching responsibilities. Other areas of influence is facilitating Bible studies. Because as a facilitator, you control the answer, right? Other areas is um, as members of committees that make decisions. You say, oh no, then I cannot join camp committee. Now in camp committee, there is an inner committee, all right? The camp master, the church leaders, the session members in the church leaders, um, they are the core committee. They make decisions. You participate in there, you help in areas as they um, assign to you. We welcome all to participate in that, in that sense. So, that, so you can't be a, a president of a fellowship group or leader in a fellowship group and then you do not believe in the church beliefs. Even if you're a member, it makes no sense because you're going to influence, you're going to set direction for the group. Understand that? So do you, do you agree that all these things are the right things to do? Do you have a question? Oh no, okay. Are the right things to do? It is for the good of the church. You want to be part of a church like that or you want to be a part of a church that is chaotic? So now, um, Can you join the choir if you are a non-member? Our requirement is that you must be a believer. You do not need to be a member if you are just a choir member. You know why? Because we choose the song you sing. We dictate the, the, mem the choir person who is the choir leader who is a member. The person dictates how you sing it, right? The person dictates how the, the presentation is done. So you're, you are detected too, and you just obey. Why we require you to be at least a believer is because what is choir singing? Entertaining men? No. It is presenting an item to God, right? Can an unbeliever, will God accept an unbeliever presenting a song to him? No. All right? So that's why minimum member, a minimum safe person. That's why we interview you for your salvation. Um, other areas that are non areas of non influence of leadership areas, um, the um, the the kitchen ministry, the food ministry, um, kind things like that. All right, evangelism, join us, um, but we won't let you go and preach the Roman Catholic gospel. <laughs> All right, so this area is not an area of influence that will cause chaos in the church. That those are fine. So now we understand why. It is not because we are legalistic, we are difficult, we are judgmental. Yes. What about musicians? Musicians only members. Okay, because why? It's always the concept of area of influence. You're the musician, you dictate the tempo, you dictate the way it's played, you dictate the whole um, 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 atmosphere of the song. Alright, so you're leading them. So we would not want. Same for members. If you're a member, we do not support contemporary Christian music. Right? One day, by God's grace, by God's will, we'll cover that. So, as a musician, one of the things we'll dictate is you cannot listen to CCM in your private life because the playing will begin to creep into church. How the church pianists play, very often you know what kind of songs the church pianists listen to because it will come into the playing. It becomes part of you. Right? Understand that? So that's important. Now, the next thing. Now, what about uh, all right, turn back to page 230. Now, so please remember, point number four is very important. As a member, do not sow discord. Now, what happens if one day you change? Hmm? One day you change. One day you 
really cannot accept premillennial eschatology. What happened? If you're a member, or one day as a church leader, I change. One day I start to think, I don't believe in infant baptism anymore. What should you do as a member, as a church leader? Remember, we all took a vow, right? And the vow is point number three. Look at point number three, page 230. Cannot, the Constitution cannot bind anyone's conscience. Understand that? The Constitution cannot bind anyone's conscience means at the end of the day, you are responsible regarding your belief to God. Understand that? So we, as long as you want to be under the Constitution, you took a vow, is what you believe. But if you choose to change, the Constitution cannot bind you in the sense you can choose to resign. You can choose to step down. Understand that? Okay, you cannot say, I have no choice, lah. I vow already. So forever, I, I no. All right, this is a vow to a constitution. You can feel free to move on to another church. Hmm? Understand that? Okay, of course, we'll do our best to explain and convince you um, again, but we cannot bind you. But you cannot also bind the church. <laughs> All you need to do is explain, announce, and then as a leader, it is honorable to step down, right or not? If one day you... If one day I do not believe in infant baptism anymore, should I go up there and still keep doing infant baptism? The constitution cannot bind me. It's our belief, it cannot bind me. If one day I really believe it's wrong, which, which, which by the way, is right. <laughs> right. We covered that in BBK in, in some detail. Those of you who are going through the cycle, if you miss that, come, continue coming, you understand it. Then, should I pretend and go up there and keep doing it? It's not honourable. If I do not believe in this church beliefs anymore, should I as a leader say, all right, join membership now, come, come. Then as you join membership, I don't make you take an oath because I don't believe it anymore. So I do not make you take an oath anymore. I don't ask you, do you believe in this church beliefs? Because I know I change, right? I know I change. So I better not ask you whether you believe in everything or neither should I make you take an oath anymore. Then you skip the part about the oath. Should you do that? It's not honourable. Okay, so remember... The leaders must be honourable. So one day if I change, I should go up to the pulpit, especially leaders. Now members, you don't have to say, oh no, now I don't believe in total abstinence anymore. Should I need to go up to the pulpit and say, ah, ladies and gentlemen, as a member, I do not believe. You don't need to, all right? You're a, you're a private member in that sense. But for a church leader, you cannot because you are publicly voted in by members, right? So members publicly put their faith in you, that you believe in his beliefs and you will protect and um, promote his beliefs to the members. So because it's public, then for a church leader, it is only right that he go up and say, I'm sorry, I do not believe in this church beliefs anymore, or actually I never believed in it, I made a mistake, um, allow me to um, explain and I wish to step down. That's the honourable thing to do. All right? I've seen that happen. And it's honourable, and people, at least they respect you. And then you do not, instead of going round, to continue to cause confusion and division. All right, then you continue to worship in the church. That's it. Yeah, but if you find another church that is, that is uh, more suitable in its beliefs. Now, so to some people, immersion is, is the world. Okay? I cannot take it if I'm not immersed. I think it's unbiblical. I should explain before in BBK, those of you who don't understand. Um, sprinkling, this church believes in sprinkling and immersion. We practice sprinkling by and large. I take sprinkling from scriptures as um, a more um, clear um, principle, then immersion. But some people say, ah, oh, I really cannot take it. I'm, I believe only in immersion. Then you find that you must go to a Baptist church which practice only immersion and you're happy there. Then so be it. Okay, so, so some of these things. But if you say, I don't believe in Jesus Christ as God anymore, uh, that one is different. We will definitely try to talk and convince you, all right? Um, okay, so do you understand that now? Any questions so far? Okay. Point number, uh, page 231. Now that, so now you are going to, um, if you're going to join membership, now there are some key doctrinal positions that you must be very clear about. Alright, so 
Now, page 231 to 233 um, is taken uh, by and large from Pandans, Kerry Pandans Constitution, which pretty much is, um, ours is pretty much the same. Um, so, we just go through that very quickly. Now, a few things. The doctrinal position of the church, page 231. This is in Article 4, all right? Now, our church is conservative, orthodox. We are not new evangelical. Remember we, taught, we studied what is new evangelical on Friday? Um, but what is important I want to highlight is we are not just conservative on paper, we are conservative in practice. Okay, remember I highlighted, I highlighted on Friday many churches, you see they have all the biblical separation, <clears throat> all the conservative doctrines there, but in practice they teach, do something else. Okay, so when you join this church, um, be clear that in, both in beliefs and practice, we are orthodox and um, not new evangelical in practice. Point number two, all right, Kavri Pandan, well, in our case, BPCWA, um, it's a militant church. What does it mean? <laughs> a militant church. Oh no, we are militant fundamentalists. Whenever you hear this word, militant fundamentalists, sometimes when I type that to do some research, militant fundamentalists. I think maybe the NSA is uh, tracking me. <laughs> right? These two words put together is very dangerous. <laughs> now, what does it mean we are militant and we are fundamentalists? Now, look at page, uh, point number two. It is not a reference to violence, such as taking up arms, but in spiritual sense, it is both apologetical. Apologetical is not we apologize for what we believe. Right? It defends the defense of truth. So you can put that we defend the truth. Number one, as well as polemical. Polemical. Now it is about we attack falsehood. We attack falsehood. We are exposed actively. We are militant in that sense. When God's word is attacked, what do we do? We will defend. We will stand up. We will not say, let's not talk about it. All right, this, is, this causes split churches to split. Let's not talk about it. No, we will defend anything that is God's truth, whether it's His word or any doctrines or any practices. We will actively write to tell people that this is the proper defense. We explain to them what is the truth. What is... Polemical means we don't just keep quiet. Is charismatism a problem in this church so far? <laughs> no, right? Are we practicing tongue speaking? Does someone want to practice tongue speaking? Someone to, during worship service or in private, want to stand up and heal people? We don't have this problem, right? Does it mean we do not then talk about charismatism? Because defense means there is a problem, then we defend, right? Polemical means when we spot something, we will actively go and expose also. Understand that? We will actively expose. We will actively teach about what's wrong with the cults, what's wrong with charismatism, what's wrong with Roman Catholic Catholicism, what's wrong with the ecumenical movement. We will write, we will preach, we will teach, we will expose and we will attack. Understand that? To take back grounds for God, that is what it is. But we always do it in the right spirit, not a proud, judgmental, holier than thou spirit. Understand that? Okay, so we are polemical, we are not proud. We do it because we love God and His truth. Okay? So, as a member, please do that rightly, okay? So, as a member, you know we are, pol we are polemical, but do it rightly. Um, be very careful. Sometimes that's a problem with fundamental churches because this is not explained properly. They thought that everything that moves, they want to go out and shoot. All right? And they pick on everything. That is not the spirit. Okay, we must understand what are battles that are very important. What are things that are... Um, right, we are not going to actively go out and keep shouting, oh, those who are immersed, you are wrong and all that. All right, those areas, no. Okay, so next thing. So please remember this church is both. Remember when we talk about the splits, the various splits in Asia and in the US. If this man were not polemical, we would not have what we have today. If this man were not apologetical, we would not have what we have today. BP would not exist. We will only be a big new evangelical Christendom. Okay? So it is. God calls us to what? What earnestly for the faith? 
contend earnestly for the faith once delivered unto the saints, right? So where to contend means you have to stand up and fight for it, okay? Now, if someone says something wrong about your father or your mother, accuse them of something that's false, what are you going to do? Sit down, keep quiet. They attack, you smile at them some more. You naturally stand up and defend. And naturally stand up and expose that that is false. My father did not say this. My father is not alive. My father did not do this. My mom did not do this, right? Why? Because you love them. You, you are concerned about their honour. Okay? So that is why we do it, not because we are critical. Um, next. Now then, Article 6. All right, point number 2. Um, we take a strong stand on the doctrine of biblical separation. Understand that. Underline that. Remembering that this is the first, deline, first defense against the enemy of God. That is in article number 6. So, now, we have here article number 6. What is biblical separation? Number 1, 6.1. It is separation from sin unto God. That's a fundamental principle of the Bible. It is ignored by many churches today. That's why when you say, Oh, I'm from uh, Bible Presbyterian Church or, or Bible Presbyterian Church of Western Australia. Typically, like a brother shared, they, their first reaction, Oh, the church that separates. <laughs> the church that separates. Separation is something that is taught since the Old Testament through the New Testament. Right? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. Old Testament, God make them wear clothes that is not mixed between wool and... I uh, can't remember. And? Linen. Wool and linen. Alright? Today you wear clothes mixed with wool and linen. It's probably wool and linen. Why did God use that? God used that to teach the people that even in daily things as they put on, they remember separation. Don't mix. Don't mix. Not that wool and linen are, are sinful things, alright? But He used that to teach them what food to eat, what not to eat. It's to teach them separation. All right, so today the principles still stand. Doesn't mean that we cannot wear certain things, we cannot eat certain food, except blood, eh? very clear. Um, but, but it's all the principle of separation from Old Testament to the New Testament. It is taught in the Bible. Um, why do we emphasize this? On that day, when you join membership, this is one of the things we will make very clear. Do you believe and will practice biblical separation? Why do you think we are so serious about this? The whole history in the last three week Fridays, or last four Fridays, we looked at. What is it about? Why, we, why the people fail? Because they fail to separate from falsehood, false teachers, right? That is what caused Christendom to fall. That is why this is very important. It was just timely. We just taught that, so now I can explain to you why we highlight this in the Constitution. We will ask this in the membership um, joining. Because when, when the church begins to compromise, tolerate, and work with, when members want to do that, that is when the church will begin to slide and fall. Well, remember about Kwek Sui Hua? He wanted to bring in doctrines that were against the, the biblical account of creation, right? The members wanted to work with new, new evangelicals, ecumenists. And then instead of separating getting it out of the church. Members brought it in, members won it. Instead of practicing personal biblical separation, the church is, you saw the video, right? What it is today. All because of a failure to practice biblical separation at a personal level, as a member, as a church level, at leadership for the church. Understand that? That is why this is so important. It's the first line of defense. You, we do not want BPCWA to be like those videos. Just replace our name there. Biblical separation is where it begins. Okay? Understand that. It's not a negative doctrine. It's a doctrine of protection. If you're sick, as a parent, if there's a major flu bug out there, what do you do? You isolate your children. Hey, so-and-so, the area, a lot of sick people don't go there, right? That's what you do normally. You yourself also make sure that you separate and don't bring this into your home. Okay, so separation. Now, next, point 6.2. The doctrine arises out of holiness of God. It is not our own doctrine. Let's read together. Be ye holy. Let's read. Be ye holy, for I am holy. This word holy, as I've explained, means set apart. I am set apart from all falsehood. I'm set apart from all sin. 
I am God, I am set apart. You also set yourself apart. Understand? That's the meaning of holy. Set apart from sin, falsehood, in, in beliefs and practices. So it arises from holiness of God. What? So next time I ask you, why do we practice biblical separation? Why is the doctrine of biblical separation in the Bible? Because it arises out of the holiness of God. That is why. God is holy, God is pure. So it arises out of the holiness of God. Now, po- point six, point three. Now, the Bible does speak of cooperation. So, does the Bible tell us to cooperate? Yes. Many verses, labor us together, keep the unity of the Spirit, follow peace with all men and holiness, and so on and so on. So, if the Bible tells us to cooperate, then why aren't we cooperating with all? Page 232. However, right at the top, biblical cooperation is based upon truth. Understand that. Do we cooperate? We cooperate with many churches with Pandan, with Gethsemane, with Melbourne BPC, uh, Bethel BPC. We cooperate with other churches because the criteria is what? They practice biblical separation. It's always based on truth. The moment any of this church, even though it's my classmate and my bestest friend, even if it's my lecturer, or as a lecturer, even if it is his student, the moment that minister, that church does not practice uh, biblical separation does not teach the truth, do not stand for the truth. We do not have spiritual cooperation anymore. Understand that? Okay? Um, so it is not truth, in all, seeking truth in all religion. You pick up, you go pick up uni- Uniting Church magazines. Sometimes they are in some shops or outside the church area. And you read, they, will, they want to dialogue with every religion, with any beliefs, with Roman Catholics, to be united, to cooperate. That is not us. Okay, we cooperate. We biblical separation is not isolation. Understand that? Isolation is cultist. BBCW is the best church. I don't want you to attend any other church when you go to Singapore, when you go to Melbourne. I don't want you to listen to anything from there. I don't want you to talk to them. You can only listen to me and this church. This isolation. Understand that? We seek fellowship, cooperation, working with like-minded. Biblical separated church that stand for the truth. There are plenty, plenty for us. But sometimes I do not know why people die, die. There are already so many, but they must choose one that does not practice truth, does not, does not practice biblical separation. They want that one. <laughs> All right, so now, page um, 232, um, 6.7. God commands his people to be separate from all unbelief. Um, he says, be ye not unequally yoked with, together with unbelievers. Okay, so do not yoke yourself. Means do not put the same, that, that wooden thing together and work together in the field. Um, in, the, in, the, in the gospel field. It does not work. It does not work. Okay, next. Um, page, uh, point six, point seven. Instead, what does God say? Come out from among them. See the bottom of point six, point seven. Come out from among them. Come out, that is what we are expected to do, not be part of it. Now, what happens if your school has um, activities with these groups, religious activities? God says, come out, do not participate in it, do not lend your, render your support for them. Understand that? You want to do mission trip, you want to do uh, mission work, you want to um, give, you want to, there are plenty that we can recommend you to. Many. All right? So God says, do not be unequally yoked with them. Means do not go out to the field, you know it's unequal yoke, two animals, huh? they, are put, they put on a yoke, then they go farming, understand? On the field farming. So he said, don't put a donkey and a cow and an ox together. That's unequal yoke. God said, don't do that. You know what happens when you do that? The farmers know, say, ah, yeah, which crazy farmer would do that? Put a donkey and an ox. We don't understand, right? we are not farmers. When you put a donkey, the donkey is a very stubborn animal. Understand that. You, the ox go here, it will want to go there. All right, you know what happened to the field when they're plowing? You look at the field, whoa, like that, you know, and turn back some more. A lot of problems. Some, some even describe the ox don't want to work with the donkey because the donkey's breath is very smelly. <laughs> then the ox will keep turning away. Every time the donkey breathes, the ox will turn away. So you go one big mess. So they say, it doesn't work. Farmers don't say, it's a stupid thing to do. Don't. So God says, you know it doesn't work. So why do you do it in the field with this? They say, don't, okay? Now, number 6.8. Very clearly, in our constitution, we will state, 
We oppose all forms of modernism, cultism, Romanism and false religion. Dialogue for the purpose of reaching compromise with all true believers, we do not support that. 6.9. We are opposed to all efforts to obscure or wipe out the clear line of separation between, between absolutes and truth. Doesn't mean that you separate your part of the church, you won't do this. You can try to obscure. Obscure means let us not teach this. Let us don't make this so clear. Let us blur this area. Understand that? Contemporary Christian music. Let's just bring in some. Keep it blur. All right? Um, uh, I understand here last time they say, oh, don't talk about VPP. Don't talk about preservation. Let's keep it blur. In fact, let's try to obscure it by mixing with those that are against the doctrine of preservation. Let's invite them. Let's be part of them. That's obscuring. The line is not clear to members anymore. Why do you think I put out the names of the churches? I was wondering whether to, and I was praying, should I do that? But we must make the line clear. Make the line clear so that the members are not confused. The members know um, to be careful. Okay, it is not to criticize them. They put out our names, all right? Be sure of that. They put out our names. These are the churches. Don't go there. They teach preservation. Huh? Silly people who believe that God gives you a photocopied Bible. How can you believe that? All right? So they openly would tell us. They also don't want to obscure. Now, 6.10. The church has been founded on the biblical principle of separation and we seek fellowship with like-minded BP churches. Okay, so that's why I seek fellowship with this coming young people's camp. We want to drive it because we want like-minded Christians to come and fellowship. That's why we are organizing it. Okay, we are not isolationist. Now, the conclusion. Whoa. Okay, we got to end here. Please remember, look at conclusion. The Constitution does not supersede the Bible. Now, in a nutshell, what is the Constitution? Underline, it is a handbook. Conclusion, second last paragraph, it is a handbook. In a nutshell, it gives the doctrines and practices of the church. Underline that. Next, it tells us what the church stands for. Underline that. Next, it is a manual to regulate the behaviour and conduct of every member. Underline that. And double underline this. It is to maintain harmony, unity and peace of the church. Okay? Now, now please highlight this. Everyone who wants to become a member, the last paragraph, will have to take an oath that includes his acceptance of the Constitution in, in, in its entirety. Please underline, entirety, there is no exception. Cannot, I, I don't believe in total abstinence, alright, just join. Uh. Do not, alright, until you understand that. I don't believe in biblical separation, I don't understand it yet. Then do not simply stand up and say, I want to be part of the church. I just say yes. It cannot bind our conscience. Pledge 234. Last but not least. He, a second line, he has, the person who has changed should not create trouble and sow seeds of discord to undermine the unity. This is sin. Understand that? All right? So please, we want to have a church that is peaceful, harmonious, united in heart and practice. We've seen the last few Fridays when it is not the kind of chaos it can be. Okay, we welcome all to worship with us. Do not sow discord if you don't believe. Let us pray. <laughs> now, we will cover 13 key well-known denominations. Their timeline and how they split. How the groups form. Okay, so let us turn to your diagram, please. 